Okay, I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we all meet here today. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I wish to welcome everyone online um, to our second Spotlight On uh, series, which is focused on the Pacific. Um, and we're really excited to bring this as a National Ag Day event with the Crawford Fund. So before we get started, I'd just like to give a little bit of an overview about RAID or Researchers in, in Agriculture for International Development. It's in a really exciting group of early career researchers, um, long-term career researchers, all working in the international ag research space. And what we're trying to do is build capacity over this small sector um, of all different researchers in Australia. We're also trying to create career pathways for uh, early career researchers who might not know the different avenues and different organisations that provide uh, jobs and learning opportunities. And we really want to strengthen this network so we can have the best impact that we can in the countries that we work with. Uh, so if you're interested in RAID, we have a lot of different webinars, um, capacity building activities and a large network. Um, so please get in touch with any of us today. Uh, there's going to be some links in the chat about RAID. So feel free to jump on and have a look at our website and our Facebook groups. I'm very excited to announce today too that we're bringing this webinar as part of a, a joint collaboration with the Crawford Fund. Uh, RAID is actually a program of the Crawford Fund and we're really excited to um, have them on board today. And the Crawford Fund actually do a lot of next gen programs. And so they have videos, podcasts and blogs for career pathways for people who are inter interested in that international ag space. An exciting thing that's coming out of the Crawford Fund at the moment is some student awards. And these student awards will go live shortly. And they're about um, giving students the opportunity to be able to uh, go overseas and study um, a research project and really build up their networks overseas. I can't recommend this program highly enough as I was lucky enough to um, be one of the student award recipients back when I finished uni and I had the best time and made the best network over in Cambodia. So I really recommend everyone going and checking that one out. So for those of you who didn't join us on our first Spotlight On series, these are little webinars that we're doing as part of the RAID um, portfolio. And what we're doing is trying to connect people who are interested in different regions across the international ag space and looking at developing networks, um, what's current research happening in these areas, development opportunities, a little bit about the culture, and like I said, connecting like-minded people. So we want these webinars to be as informative um, as possible. You might meet some people who are working in these countries and then also hear about how uh, our speakers got into these countries and their career pathway. So today I'm very excited to have three panelists join us. Um, all of them have exciting careers and um, are working in the international ag space. Uh, they all come from different backgrounds. So we've got a wide diversity of people speaking today. Um, but our first speaker is Cooper Shooton and he works as a bee researcher in Southern Cross University um, on various ACA projects. So, I'll get uh, Cooper to just share his screen and we'll jump straight into it. Excellent. Thanks for that, Jess. I'll uh, just wait for your screen to finish and just get the thumbs up that that's working all right for everyone. All right, yes. excellent. Morning, everyone. Thanks everyone for joining. I know we're all living in the screen dream at the moment, being online so much, but um, yeah, for those who don't know me already, my name's Cooper Shooton. I'm a lecturer at Southern Cross University uh, and also the project manager for Bees for Sustainable Livelihoods Research Group. Um, often in life, we like to think we got to where we are just because of all our own hard work, but I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the love and the support of a lot of the people that I work with at SCU, at ACR, a lot of the researchers, the organisations that we work with overseas, a lot of the partner countries, um, and most importantly, all the beekeepers that we work with out in those rural areas. So um, I work in projects here in Australia. Um, I also work on projects overseas. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Some, you know, all that... Um, 
all things bees overseas, basically, and um, chat about some of the experience I've had getting to where I am these days. So to be honest with you, I didn't even know that my job existed when I finished my degree. Um, in lots of ways, it's still evolving, the, the work that I do, but um, you've probably heard already that I'm really into beekeeping. So it's about bees. A lot of people ask me about how the bees are, but it's not just about the bees. It's about helping people without exacerbating environmental degradation. Um, and it's through beekeeping that I've also been able to find something that's embedded so many of my own core personal values. So I love being in nature. I care about the environment. Um, I like to keep fit and healthy. Believe it or not, some of those boxes there weigh about 45 kilos. They're pretty heavy, so it's like going to a gym almost, but um, try lifting those up while you're getting stung by bees. Or in Papua New Guinea, you've got to sort of cart those honey boxes up and down mountainsides. It gets pretty hard. Um, I really love meeting new people uh, and exploring new places. Um, it makes me feel really present when I'm doing beekeeping. I forget about all my emails and other problems that I've got going on. And at an individual level, I think individual bees are so fascinating when I think about them as a, a super organism. They're incredible on an apiary scale. And then trying to think about how we can develop these different industries across the Pacific is a whole different kettle of fish. And it's an exciting thing to try to understand how we can do better. Um, so I used to work for a commercial beekeeper when I was in high school to make a little bit of money on the side. I fell in love with being in the forest um, and being out yeah, in the environment. And I now run a small but profitable bee business in Northern New South Wales. Um, and I often have students that come to my office and they ask me, how'd you get into bees? How did you pick that? And I, I kind of just try to reflect on the fact that I, I feel like I just focused on those things I was interested in. I like meeting new people. I like, you know, doing things in and around the environment. But I guess something that's been a major driver for me, and, and it is every day in my work, is that it just doesn't sit well with me in my heart that there are so many farmers out there that go to bed hungry at night time that live in poverty. And so some of these people now are some of my best friends that live overseas. And so I really wanted to be able to find a way and work hard to try to be able to combine these things that I love into my job. And I feel really fortunate I've been able to do that. Um, so I did my undergrad in environmental science at SCU. Uh, and in my third year, um, I heard through the Crawford Fund about a new Colombo Plan scholarship and some of the scholarships they've got at the moment as well. Uh, I applied for that and was successful. Found myself uh, up in Gleno in the Emura district in Timor-Leste. Where's Timor? Straight above Darwin. It's one of the poorest countries in the world in terms of multidimensional poverty outside of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and this young boy here was admitted to HIAM Health, which is a non-for-profit NGO um, that working with kids that are suffering from malnutrition. Um, I was up there uh, talking to a lot of young people and I was seeing that they're harvesting honey from the tops of these, these trees. It's not bees in white boxes. These are massive bees, that five metre wide combs. And, you know, communities are, you know, people fall to their deaths trying to harvest this honey where they share that honey money amongst their community. And I, I realised that, you know, beekeeping can be an amazing way of generating income without exacerbating environmental degradation. But there's a lot that needed to be done to try to improve that situation. Um, and when I came home, I also realised that unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. So the majority of the world's poor population, they live in rural areas, the farmers, they're heavily dependent upon agriculture to generate income. And so, you know, helping any farmer in the world, even for myself, is pretty complicated stuff. So I, I realised I needed to learn more. I realised that helping people in Timor and these other countries is going to be pretty complicated. So I I uh, signed up for an honours degree uh, and I applied for a small research activity with ACR looking at the beekeeping industries in um, Timor-Leste in Indonesia. And I, I really haven't looked back since. I've been doing this every second of my working day since. Um, I was in Indonesia tramping around in the forest, talking with communities, working with government organisations and NGOs, trying to work out how beekeeping is um, contributing to farmers' incomes and people's livelihoods, but also some of the barriers to the sustainability of those enterprises and, and their productivity. Um, I wasn't kidding when I was talking about this is dangerous. This is a, a young man, the, the, the dark leaves on the side there, that's the top of the canopy. I had a big lens on the canopy is probably maybe 20 meters high and that rope's not for his safety. That's just to lower the honey down. And usually they don't have a, a veil. So it's pretty wild stuff. Um, I've since been back leading New Colombo Plan scholarships with students um, and been able to go back and meet a lot of these communities uh, over time. It gives me a lot of satisfaction. I realise that this is just so much fun. This is so much potential for supporting communities and to be able to travel. So I signed myself up for another three years of blood, sweat and tears in a PhD. Um, and I started making a bit of my name for myself in the beekeeping side of things. I ended up getting some contracts with some, some NGOs and government organisations, et cetera. I worked with Oxfam, 
market development facility on some um, aid programs. Uh, I ended up working and living in Papua New Guinea for a year, which was a wild and wonderful experience. This is me before I cut my hair. I'm a corporate coop now, but it was a very challenging but very rewarding experience living in the highlands. Um, I really love challenging my worldviews and my understanding of the world and trying to adjust to the language and the food and the culture and, you know, the consistently quite uncomfortable at times, the things that you see and hear. But I guess part of that has also helped me to grow as a person. And I think it's the reality of, of life for a lot of rural people, about half the world's population living on less than $3 a day. So, you know, I love the feeling of being outside of my comfort zone and learning and getting amongst it, jumping in, saying yes and having a go. Um, I love the complexity of trying to work out solutions to, to problems. I was up in a really rural area here in PNG, um, trying to get beekeeping going. The community said they really are interested and they've got a bit of a start. And I got up there and I said, what have you got to make beehives? And they said, we've got sticks. <laughs> so anyway, we, we made it work. Um, a year later, I was sent these photos of some samples of honey. They're testing the quality of it in the market for some of those products. So where there's a will, there is a way. Um, I really love seeing the progress of all the different activities that we work on from the burnt beeswax that's causing biosecurity problems in the apiary to, you know, getting people to show me what they can, the best stuff they're making and now producing, you know, international quality stuff, supporting people to give ongoing training and developing value out of products and candles, soaps, lip balm, surf wax, surf zinc, things like that. I really love watching the people build their confidence um, and giving in giving training and running their own businesses and providing effective training and education extension services and transforming their knowledge and their skills into resources that they can share with their family and friends and within their industry. Um, I also love watching the beekeepers that they've only got, you know, one or two bee colonies left and they've got all sorts of challenges going on. You do some capacity building and training with some of the local people there and you come back in a year or two and all their colonies are full of bees and full of honey and they're feeling confident and they're paying for their kids to go to school and they're fixing that roof on their, on their house that's leaking. Um, I love working with the beautiful people, there's a bee people, <laughs> the friendships that are made. And I, I can't say that I could ever teach uh, more than they've all taught me in a lot of these places. And I also really love uh, a lot of the students that I get to work with um, here in Australia and overseas and get to supervise and watch them grow their skills and their confidence in carving out their niche and what it is that they're doing and creating impact. And also seeing some of the beekeepers that I work with overseas come and work with some of the commercial beekeepers that I used to work with here in Australia, which is pretty fun. So yeah, I guess what we're trying to do is try to promote more productive and sustainable beekeeping enterprises uh, in developing countries, but also that have outcomes for Australian beekeeping industry here. And, um, building that scientific and research capacity um, and those relationships with these different organisations and people. And I think they've enabled me and the people involved in the project to not only try to increase incomes and outcomes for these communities overseas, but also, you know, it's, it's helped the whole team to be able to develop skills that are going to be of real value within our own lives, you know, in running our own businesses, uh, in conducting research projects, in managing projects and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, lots of different opportunities. And I, I guess for myself personally, this research and this career has also given me a lot of purpose in life and a lot of direction. So I'd say if anyone's keen to get into international agricultural research or beekeeping in particular, um, be in touch. Uh, I don't think there's ever better, been a better time than now to do so. I think if you've got a dream and you work hard enough towards it, you can achieve whatever it is that you want to do. It's a part of an um, amazing thing that, yeah, living in the country like we do. So thanks everyone for joining and I'm happy to answer any questions and happy Ag Day, everyone. Thanks, Cooper. That was awesome. Um, I'm blown away. And as I always am with any bee researchers that I meet, it's a whole industry that, you know, doesn't come to front of mind sometimes when you think of agriculture, but is integral. I was just looking at your key partners there on your side. I mean, you've got the coffee industry, the livestock industry um, on all your partners. So it's interesting to see that bees are such a big component of everything. So Thank you. Um, we might leave our questions for Cooper at the end for um, the panelists Q&A. So keep writing those in the chat as well, guys. Sorry, the Q&A section as well, guys. Um, but I'd just like to announce our next speaker, which is James Quitley from um, ACIA. He's the Research Program Manager for Soil and Land Management, or SLAM, as he's affectionately told me it's called. Um, but James, did you want to start sharing your screen and we'll jump right in? I will. Let me just start that. 
Is that sharing correctly? Perfect, right Thanks. away. Thank you very much. Um, Cooper, I recently became a beekeeper myself, so and I, and I, uh, I can see how it could be addictive. And I think if I had a, got into bees at an earlier point in my career, I may well have followed a very similar pathway to you. Um, so I will quickly just introduce ASIA, which is the, the, the organisation I, I work for. Many of you probably know ASIA. It's the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. I'll tell you a bit about my career um, and then focus on, on the work we're doing in the Pacific. And, and really, I think it demonstrates why I love the job that I have. Um, so ASIA is part of the foreign affairs portfolio within um, the Australian government. It, it sits alongside DFAT, but not, a, it, not part of DFAT. We work very closely with D, DFAT in all the countries in which we operate, which is about 30 countries and we're, we're operating about 200 projects at any one time. We have a very big scholars program and that scholars program has been running since ACA began. So we now have scholars who are very advanced in their careers in many of the countries in which we operate. And we tend to find that gives us, you know, the most, the most valuable soft diplomacy you can, can get. These, these people have come to Australia and spent time in Australia in the formative years of their careers and now back leading agencies and, and high up in ministries of agriculture and other parts of governments in the, in the countries in which we work. We're really a, a, um, a, 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 an organisation that focuses on the most broad definition of agriculture you can imagine. Um, it's fisheries, forestries and, and, and you, you, your normal agriculture, um, horticulture and so forth agribusiness but we get into everything from bees to um to, to pearl handicraft in the pacific um we are not a research organization ourselves we we commission research and really the the ac's role is brokering partnerships and supporting experts from australia and around the world to come together to help lift um, and improve the livelihoods of, of smallholder farmers from across the world. Um, and really the, the reason ACA began is because back in the 1980s, there were some, some, some brilliant minds who realised that Australia had a lot to offer in agriculture to the world um, in, in terms of our scientific capacity. And we now have Australian scientists working almost across the entire globe on ACA research but particularly focused in, in, in the Pacific and Southeast Asia is, is the largest part of our, our, our program. So to me, um, I was actually a software developer when I left high school and, and it, was, it was a fun time. I got to see a bit of the world, but all I really got to see was the inside of hospitals and, and pathology labs. I was working for a software company that developed hospital software. So I traveled a lot, but saw not much. Um, I didn't really get to a diversity of experiences. A hospital is a hospital is a hospital. Although that's not really true because if you've ever been to a hospital in PNG, or if you've ever been to a hospital in the back, in the, in, in the rural areas of, of India or, or, or the Philippines, that, that's a very different hospital to anything you'd ever experience here in Australia. Um, but I found that the work I was doing didn't give me a lot of satisfaction as, 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 as an individual. It didn't make me feel like I was contributing. And I took some time um, off. I took about a year off and traveled and particularly traveled through North Africa and the Middle East and realized that the, these, the communities in those regions were incredibly poor, but they relied totally on agriculture. It was, it was their income source, it was their food source, it was everything, it was their livelihoods. And I, I realised that I had the potential to, to, to I was, wasn't too old at the time, I had the potential to go back to uni and, and, and study agriculture with the idea that if, if, I, if I found the right doors, I could find my way into research, agricultural research for development. So I came back to Australia, studied agriculture at, at Sydney University, went straight into a, into a PhD after that, um, fell in love with soils um, uh, and, and, and then 
actively sought opportunities to, to get overseas. Um, I worked for New South Wales DPI in forests for a little while after my PhD. Um, my PhD was looking at organic amendments in soil, but in conventional agricultural systems in our broadacre wheat cotton rotations out in the central west of New South Wales. And it was, it was, it gave me a, a really good grounding in agriculture um, in Australia, but soils, um, the problems that Australian farmers are facing with soils are, are in many ways the same problems that smallholders are facing. We, the, we're all, all of the world's agriculture, particularly in dry areas, are dealing with increasingly intense droughts, um, heat's a problem, salinity's a problem. So I, I knew by studying soils in Australia that I wasn't constraining myself to a, a career that would only fit within an agricultural context in Australia, but gave me the skills and ability to, 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 to go beyond Australia. I have to say, I still love Australian agriculture. It's, it's still um, dear to my heart and I, I still, part of the joy of the job that I currently have is that I still get to engage with Australian agriculture because it is the Australian agricultural expertise that we're trying to bring to the developing worlds that we work or the developing world that we work with. So a door opened to me in 2011, late 2011 to go to the Philippines with my then um, partner, who's now my wife, um, and she agreed to go to the Philippines with me for, she thought one year, um, we ended up staying for seven and a half and we both loved it. And I worked, well, we ended up both working at the International Rice Research Institute. And that's part of a, a global um, uh, group of advanced agricultural research organizations that are known as the CGIAR or Consultative Group of International Agricultural Research. And it was just amazing, the, the, the diversity of people, the diversity of landscapes, the diversity of problems um, that that organisation is addressing around the world is extraordinary. Um, it's, uh, I think there's roughly about 10,000 scientists working within the CGIR and it covers all agricultural commodities, very similar to, to to ACR, livestock, fisheries, forestry, horticulture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my focus there was working on the diversification and mechanization of rice-based systems, recognizing that land is becoming scarce. We can't continue to expand agriculture. And in fact, the best agricultural land is often being swallowed up by the urban sprawl of large cities. Um, so how are we going to grow more food to feed more people with less farmers, less land, less water and increasing costs of input. So it was really about trying to look at a futuristic rice system and rice is, is probably the most, well, it is, it's the most important food staple in the world. I think about half the world's population relies on rice as a food staple. And it, it also gave me an understanding of what an exciting time it is to be in agriculture. That, that ch those changes, that they're, in some ways they're terrifying, um, but in other ways they're incredibly exciting because the, in the innovations of scientists and farmers in, in every context is, is extraordinary. So the, the photo on the top left is the, a very traditional way of, of planting rice. Um, it's, it's incredibly manual, it's incredibly laborious, it's backbreaking work. Then you move to the photo in the middle and, and this was a, probably a, a, about two decades ago, it was a, a fairly simple way to direct seed a flooded field. And now you move to the photo on the right and mechanical transplanters, and that's a two wheel, but they come in fairly large four wheel mechanical transplanters, a, a, a planting, increasingly large areas across Asia um, for rice. And then if you look at the photo at the bottom, if you think about the Mekong River Delta in, in, the, in the early 90s, it was, 99, it was over 90% hand harvested the rice there. And that's probably the biggest single rice producing area on the face of the earth. They produce three to four rice crops every year. 
in a period of 10 years, it went from over 90% hand harvested to over 90% mechanically harvested by combine harvesters. And it's through farmers innovation. They work together to change the shape of their fields, to change the size of their fields, to make sure machines could access it. They worked with the machinery producers to produce machines that work in a flooded system. So this, this combine harvester here, it bags it. it. You would never see this in Australia, but it bags the rice. If, if, you, if you put the rice in a bin, the, the combine harvester becomes too heavy and it sinks into the rice. So they bag the rice, they drop the rice off the edge of the machine as it fills up and they can harvest the whole field like that. And then they're just carrying bags of harvested and threshed rice off the field. So then at the end of 2018, I moved back to Australia and was lucky enough to get the role of um, research program manager at ACER. And that's when I really got my first introduction to, to, the, to the Pacific. And this image here is from the 2019 champion taro growers um, field in Samoa. So there's a, they have their annual agricultural festival and the taro farmer who won the best taro that year took me out to his fields. And it may like from a, from an Australian agricultural context and from actually from a Southeast Asian context, this doesn't look like an agricultural field, but the large leaf plant that you can see here is taro. But in amongst it, the, if, if anyone can recognize it, you've got cocoa, you've got coconuts, um, you've got other species growing in there, all of which are, are food sources and income sources for the farmers. So they have a, it's a completely different system. But in, within one generation, the far, so I talked to this farmer about you know, the history, his history of farming and he grew up, his father was a, a taro farmer. And he could remember as a child walking through taro fields where taro towered over his head. And that taro in, in, in that picture is probably my waist height and I'm, I'm six foot. So the, 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 the size of the corm on the taro, the size of the plant has decreased significantly in one generation. Historically, if you go back two generations, taro was grown with long fallows up to 15 years. And this is across almost the entire Pacific, including PNG. Um, this farmer and most taro farmers now are back-to-back -back taro, but traditionally taro doesn't need fertilizer because you've got a 15 year fallow between crops. And in that fallow, this, this area with the it would reforest you, you, the mineralization process of organic material and the, and the slow release of nutrients from the, from the soil um, is replenished um, in that 15 years. But back to back taro um, with no fertilizer very rapidly depletes the soils of, of nutrients. Asking a a Pacific farmer to, to, to fertilize taro, you'll get a strange look. You don't fertilize taro, it doesn't need to be fertilized. So finding solutions for farmers within that context is, is a challenge, but it's a real opportunity. So just to explain what another reason I love the job that I'm in, that, that picture from Google Earth captures the extent of the research that I get to be involved in. So I work with from Kiribati um, across to Bangladesh at the moment um, and most places in between. So we, we're working in Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste, Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar. Well, not Myanmar at the moment, but we do intend to go back to work with Myanmar, but within a very constrained way. Um, but it's really the introduction to the Pacific. I'm, I'm quite comfortable with sort of Asian agriculture, the Pacific agriculture is just so different. Um, and the impacts of climate change within many countries in the Pacific is, is just extreme. So this is, uh, this is uh, Funafuti in Tarawa, uh, sorry, in, in Tuvalu. So the, the, that is the atoll that is Funafuti. And this is the, the on the right hand side, the image, that's the, that's the basically the whole population of, or the majority of the 12,000 people who live in Tuvalu. Their uh, maximum um, elevation within that country is 
just over four metres above sea level. Um, and most of the island goes underwater um, when there's a high tide. And certainly if there's a storm surge, it, it disappears beneath the waves very rapidly. Traditional agricultural practices in, in, in that country just are, are failing. They, they have a, a, a um, a palaka pit which they dig into this into the coralline soils or sands and they fill it with organic matter and they plant their yams and their taros and and their, their vegetables within that and the organic organic matter breaks down and it, because they these these atolls generally sit over a freshwater lens it acts as a wicking system and the, the they they basically are quite productive but when you when you flood them with salt, they die off. So trying to find solutions for those countries and you know, Kiribati's solution is that it's bought land in Fiji with the, with the recognition that at some point they won't be able to live within their countries. But then you go to countries such as Timor-Leste um, on the left and you've got plenty of land, but you have, um, I think it's the third highest stunting rate globally um, malnutrition is rife across the country. More than 50% of children under five are, are malnourished and stunted. Um, and and it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's got huge potential, but it's incredibly challenging environment in which to work. Sandalwood, the country of, of Timor-Leste, that the picture in the middle, wood, middle is, is a sandalwood seedling. Timor less, less the, the Portuguese occupied it for, for a long, long time. And when the Portuguese arrived, it was covered in sandalwood. When the Portuguese left it, there was hardly any sandalwood left. So figuring out if we can, if and how we can reintroduce sandalwood as a livelihood option for smallholders and develop sustainable market options for them is, is, is it's a huge opportunity, but also trying to figure out how to help those farmers um, feed their families and their communities nutritious food is is probably the key priority within in timor Leste. and then obviously on the right these are actually the the winning taro from from samoa um and 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 in in the in those you know taro is probably the staple anyone who's been to the pacific would have eaten taro if you've ever had a a morning tea, a lunch, a breakfast, a dinner. Um, trying to figure out how we can encourage farmers to invest in better nutrient management and, you know, soil carbon is declining in those systems as well. So helping them understand how, or helping them move along a pathway that allows them to invest in their soils and the sustainability of their production system is key to ensuring food security within the Pacific Islands. And that food security is, is been, it's been clearly demonstrated as a result of COVID how um, tenuous the food security, food security is of a lot of these islands. Going back to Tuvalu, before COVID, it would cost you about $18 for one fresh cabbage. About a month after COVID, travel restrictions had kicked in. The cost of that cabbage had gone up to over $32 Australian dollars. So they just you know, they are isolated small island um, communities that have very limited access to their own fresh produce and are highly reliant on imported goods. So how can we help reverse that or, or turn that around to give them a, a food sovereignty that secures their futures? And on, you know, the, going back to Southeast Asia, but really the, the, the excitement that I have about agricultural research for development, it is such an evolving space. So the impact of COVID in, in India, and you may well be aware of this, but basically a huge population from the cities who were the daily wage earners, the tuk-tuk drivers, the shoe shiners, the cleaners, et cetera, et cetera, whose livelihoods were shut off when COVID hit because they locked cities down. They've moved back to their provinces. They've moved back to their home, home towns. And estimates are that over 32 million people moved from cities back to rural areas in India. Now, if you had have asked me three years ago, what's a priority in South Asia? I would have said mechanization. 
because there's not enough labor in, in rural areas to maintain productivity. They're, they're losing people out of, out of rural areas, youth are leaving, they're going to the cities in search of, of better opportunities. But that may well have changed. This pandemic has changed the world in many ways and it has changed agriculture. We don't know what the long-term implications are, but they're the kind of things that we need to know. If, if, if you think about that, the Indo-Gangetic Plains feeds about a billion people. Um, if that fails, that's a huge amount of food insecurity in the world, not just in that region. So being in international agricultural research development, it really is, as Cooper said, it's, it's just, these people are the poorest people in the world, but they feed a huge proportion of the world and making sure those farmers have real world livelihood options that are meaningful and mean that their children are healthy and educated and so forth is so important for an equitable future for this world that you know i'd encourage any of you to to, to pursue a path in agricultural research development even if you have an inkling that that might be something that you're interested in so thank you for that. If you want this presentation, there's some good information on, on the ACA website. But thank you very much for listening. Fantastic. Thank you so much, James. That was really informative, particularly that from your career leaving university, um, several different career paths, software. It just, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, if you've got any questions for James, pop them in the Q&A. Um, and we'll get to them after our final panelists, the duo of Lisa and Zoe Paisley. Um, they're co-founders from uh, um, of Aggie Global, um, and they're going to talk a little bit today about their company um, and their lives in Fiji. Thanks, girls. Thank you. Yeah, I think I just wanted to say I'm so excited, like just listening <laughs> to everyone else. I'm like, oh my god, there's so much opportunity cool and I love the passion and everything going on yeah. so I'm excited to now share some of our story as well hopefully it's as good but <laughs> we'll see <laughs> um so I'm Lisa this is Zoe um and yeah we co-founded Aggie Global in 2018 um and Aggie Global is a social business reconnecting humanity through the gift of food um, the whole goal behind it is really to alleviate poverty and address food insecurity in remote and regional areas. Um, and we actually started out in Fiji. So we'll talk about that in a bit. Yep. Hopefully. Yep. Cool. So first thing is about us. Um, like they said, I'm Zoe and Lisa. We are twins. Look very similar if you notice. <laughs> <laughs> but we also have very similar personalities and interests. And so we got into agricultural development because we're both super passionate about travel, um, food and creating impactful work, essentially. So when we were younger, we always had access to a veggie garden. I tried to find a photo of us when we were babies and it's literally <laughs> one of us has dug a hole and is trying to like bury the other one. <laughs> we, don't <so> know. <laughs> we don't know if we're trying to bury or we're just trying to clone ourselves again because, you know, we want quadruplets. Um, but anyway, so since a very young age, we've had exposure to agriculture and I think that just fed into like some of our decisions, I guess. So the local high school we went to, they had the opportunity to study ag in year 11 and 12. And we had like a plot that we got to like plant all our veggies and stuff. And I remember always at lunchtime, we'd be able to like harvest it. And then if we want to eat fresh carrots, we could eat that for lunch. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've loved that. And then when it came to picking a career at university like I said we really wanted something that was impactful and meaningful and the thing is everyone needs food everyone needs clothing everyone needs um like, like the essentials mm -hmm. so that's where we chose agriculture and we went through Sydney University and we both studied again similar interests both studied science and agriculture at UCID and during that time we literally took any opportunity we could um, to gain experience in agricultural development and with that, we got to visit Laos, which are the kind of opposite pictures, the one with the rice farmer there and the greenhouse, like homemade little greenhouse thing. And we got to explore, we got to stay in like a village and see what they were doing. And then we also got to do a second placement in Fiji. And that's where we kind of fell in love with the people and the community there, like kind of what Kubu was saying, all the people and how lovely they are. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's our first 
thing in Fiji was just doing a placement and just getting experience and learning more about it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of kick-started our journey with Aggie. Mm. So we finished university at the end of 2018, was it? Yeah. (laughs) Um, And then immediately just jumped on a flight and moved over to Fiji. Um, And while we were there, we really wanted to understand the challenges farmers were facing and what aspects we could potentially help with. Um, So in the first year, I think, we interviewed over 100 farmers um, and that was just driving out Singatoka Valley Road, which is like the salad bowl of Fiji, um, and dropping in at farmers, having tea with them and just having a good old yarn about anything. Um, And what we found was there was a lot of things they didn't have access to. So when it came to our university degree, we learned all these different aspects of like land management and like post-harvest production methods and all this kind of stuff. And these farmers just didn't have access to that information. Maybe they could find a YouTube video on composting, but they couldn't really adapt it to their farming system. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other side of it was access to buyers. Um, They couldn't find the right market to sell their produce and going to the local veggie market was time consuming and costly with the bus fares and really unpredictable. Um, So that's why we started with like an education piece um, back in 2018. So we would hold workshops for a whole village where 20, 50 farmers would rock up and we'll teach them about um, companion planting. So growing multiple plants together so then they can harvest over extended time periods rather than one crop, harvest it all in one go and then they don't have income for the next six, nine months. Um, So it was really about like helping them plan out their farm so they could start getting a more sustainable income for themselves and their families. Um, and I remember from the first workshop we did, um, it was a little bit sad. It's a bit we had um, like 20 farmers RSVP and we're like, awesome, this is going to be great. And then one person locked up and we're like, oh, damn. We did the workshop anyway because we felt like he deserved to hear about it and it was a good test for us. Um, and then three, six months later, we revisited his farm and he understood all the science behind it. He implemented like all the information um, and he was getting like five times the returns from his land. And that yeah. was just like was an amazing awesome. result. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, you were incredible. Like you actually understood it. We like passed on all this information and we could see that impact firsthand. Um, so then after the training and consultancy workshop side, we then built an e-commerce platform where farmers can now sell their produce okay. online. Um, and that's to help address all the supply and demand issues there are in Fiji. Um, at the moment, they import about 70% of our fresh fruit and veggies, um, which really took a hit during COVID, as James was saying. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're really trying to help Fiji become more self-sufficient and connect the dots because the produce is there. Um, they just need someone to help them find the mm-hmm. farmers and kind of communicate between the two parties. Yeah. yeah. So I think this has kind of been touched on as well, but initially when we started Aggie as a social business, Um, trying to use business for good and positive impact. Uh, The main thing was to be able to empower the 570 million smallholder farmers that are living in poverty. Uh, And to do this, we want to connect the small farmers to big markets. And recently that has kind of shifted just due to all sorts of things, whether it's COVID or whatnot. But now it's kind of shortened down to just reconnecting humanity through the gift of food. And I think this is something we're super passionate about is being really considerate and understanding of what people are going through. And I think a lot of that understanding can be lost in today's age, especially for farmers and people in the city. It's very different lifestyles. And a lot of city people don't necessarily understand what goes on on the farm. So, you know, there's so many bridges that we want to try to connect and, yeah, bring back together, I guess. So that's how we got there. (laughs) Um, So where is Aggie now? Uh, It's been a few years now. (laughs) Um, But a lot of this year, I would say, is has been food boxes. So within these food boxes, we fill them with fresh local food. And that's all from local farmers that are growing like, I don't know, cabbage, eggplant, whatever it is, dalo and taro and things like that. And within that, we then do weekly deliveries to people in need, Uh, whether it was people that were in lockdown and so they couldn't actually get out of lockdown to get their fresh fruit and veggies or we also have a sponsored um, crowdfunding campaign 
And so people could sponsor to buy a box and they could then send that out to a Fijian family who needs it or could not afford it. Because a big impact of COVID in Fiji, again, this is kind of being touched on, but one third of the population, mm. I believe, actually worked in tourism. So when tourism stopped, you had a third of the population with no with income. No money. Yeah. And so a big part of what we were doing during COVID was, well, the uh, Ministry of Agriculture over there, so the Fijian government, they were really promoting backyard farming and things, which was awesome, um, just to give them like su subsidize some of the income so they could grow their own food and things. Mm -hmm. And so where we could come in was try to help those um, backyard farmers, as well as the farmers already in existence that were selling to hotels and resorts. We could help them continue having an income by buying their products and putting them into these food boxes and then giving them to people in need. So this has been super rewarding and impactful for us. Um, we actually had a sponsor from the UK pay for 40 odd boxes and they sent that to a village, which is this photo. And so we got to feed an entire village. So our work has been amazing, um, really impactful and rewarding to be able to do. So, yeah. Um, and then we also started reconnecting with hotels and resorts again, um, but they want like really niche products. So in the image, it's dried flowers with sugar and like all these different things and a stereotypical Fijian couldn't care less about this, um, which is like totally fair. So um, we started pitching back to like businesses and be like, hey, here's all the local produce we can help um, you find and here are the farmers you would be supporting by working with Aggie. Um, and we've started like developing these links up again because Fiji is opening up what is in December. So we're just like doing all the groundwork to help these farmers um, connect with the businesses and start doing more bulk orders. Um, and this fleshes into uh, what's happening next with Aggie Global in terms of next year with exports. Um, but we're going to talk about that in a second. Yeah. Um, during COVID, we also came back to Australia. Um, and this is where we started up Aggie Gifts. And we wanted to mimic the model in Fiji, but given how many different Hello Freshes there are out here already doing fresh food and veggie boxes, um, we figured this wasn't necessarily the market Aggie needed to go into. So instead, we're working with Indigenous community members who are wild harvesting their traditional foods, um, and we're helping them create unique bush food products and then putting those in gift hampers and then sell, selling them as like corporate gifts or individual gift boxes, which is really cool. Um, I know this isn't an international development space, but it does show that Australia has a lot more to go when it comes to agricultural development. Like there's always more technology initiatives or community projects that people can be working on to really push the agricultural space forward. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly in indigenous communities, like. It feels like a third world country out there sometimes. So <laughs> we're just thankful we could bring this solution to Australia too. Um, yeah, so, so far we have impacted over a thousand individuals and that's both with our farmer network. So our suppliers, as well as our buyers and their families, which is really awesome. Then we've also sent back over a hundred thousand, hundred thousand AUG back to our suppliers, both in Fiji and Australia. So that's awesome too, uh, helping them to gain a better income and consistent income as well. And then 72% of our farmer network are classified as smallholder or subsistence farmers, which is really rewarding because we feel that we're addressing um, poverty and food insecurity. So yeah, I think a lot of this work as well has come about with small changes that we've been able to make, um, whether that's from our knowledge and the research from university and being able to bring that and just telling farmers hey if you make this small change you can have big impact and I think that's one of the biggest like rewards drivers. and drivers on our part is we can do small changes for that big change and it's awesome <laughs> so another incentive to get into ag development I would say yeah and then just to touch on so Aggie is growing super fast in Fiji which is so exciting to see because that impact is just scaling out um, and one of the projects we're working on next year is to help Fiji start exporting its produce because it's one of those supply and demand issues where there's all this demand in New Zealand um, for ginger, for example, this is going to be the pilot project. Um, and the farmers would love to be exporting it, but they don't have the training and the certificate certification or the record keeping in place 
Um, so in the next 12 months, Aggie is going to be working super close with five to 10 different farmers to help them get export ready and start selling like 10 times more of ginger and other products that they would initially be selling. Um, so that's really exciting. Like Aggie, Aggie's starting to grow. We're going back to some of that workshop and that education piece. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we're getting there. We're having lots of fun doing it and making heaps of impact. So yeah. <laughs> and I think it's really awesome as well. Just last thing is like, um, with international ag research, there's so much capacity and um, scope and opportunity. And it's like we didn't expect to be running a business, mm. um, but it is just a mode and a channel in which we can make that impact and to be getting our research and our knowledge to the farmers that need it. So I think it's really awesome, like James mentioned, if you're even slightly interested in international ag and development, definitely follow it up take up the opportunity and you don't know where it will take you so mm. yeah I think that's pretty much that I think we're going to be jumping into Q&A so thank any you questions so much have. Zoe but and Lisa thanks. I think you two should both have a quick look at the chat um everyone has been going off um but <laughs> a kudos to both of you and the amazing work that you're doing in Fiji and now Australia as well and I really appreciated that comment about um Australia still too has some opportunities for development as well and and like James mentioned in his um presentation that uh, you know Australian agriculture is still at a wonderful place to work in and we still can create development here um and often the two go hand in hand which is which is really good so um we're now going to move on to our Q&A for all our panelists so I hope you're all ready as we've got a fair few questions that have come through um, I'll start off by reading the ones that we've got in the Q&A uh, section here. Um, so the first one's for Cooper and it's from an anonymous and they've asked if um, you mentioned the discomfort of living in a rural developing area and it's very common that being the, uh, the other in these communities can be quite isolating. Um, can you share some of your strategies that you develop to stay confident and resilient during that time? Amazing question. That's a really great question. Um, I'd say first and foremost that it can be uncomfortable, but the majority of the experience is also, you know, is mostly positive. These people would take their shirt off their back for you. They're there, they want to feed you. And, you know, it's a, an amazing experience overall. But I think it is a really important thing to think about. Um, I'd say a couple of tips that I'm sort of thinking about would be one is probably language. Language is culture, culture is identity. If you can really apply yourself to try to understand their culture and their language, I think that, that speaks volumes in terms of respect and getting yourself out of tricky situations and that sort of thing. And just being understood, there's a lot of error there in terms of miscommunication and misunderstandings at times. I'd say like anything, try and keep healthy, do exercise. You don't want to just be locked up and not doing anything and yeah, just jump in. I mean, if it's uncomfortable, you might feel weird going for a run, but just do it, go for a jog and <laughs> you'll meet people and you'll feel fit and healthy and yeah, eat well and that sort of thing. Um, and I'd say that also it may feel uncomfortable, but often people are just interested. Give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, people often, they might be staring at you, but it's probably because they're like, what are you doing here? This is cool. They probably just want to have a chat. They're trying to understand what's going on. So just reciprocate that, uh, yeah, that sort of interest, I guess. I'm trying to understand what their worldviews are and where they're going, what they're doing. Great question. Yeah, exactly right, Cooper. And I think, um, you know, they're probably just as nervous as you are as well and often maybe breaking down the barrier a little bit and just... You know, like you said, jump in and see what happens. Hey, <laughs> act yeah, confident. Absolutely. No one, no one will question. Hey, it's a <laughs> awesome. Thanks for answering that one. Um, the next one is from Katarina, um, and this is for everyone. So I might start with James first, and we'll go around. Um, but James, what would your advice be to someone interested in a career in in um, ag for development? who doesn't necessarily have an ag environmental science background. I suppose um, from your perspective, James, coming from that software development, um, Katarina's coming from an um, environmental policy and management and law degree. So a little bit out of out of the ag space, but. So there's, yeah. I mean, so ag agricultural research for development will not be successful if it's just scientists. 
it, it mm -hmm. can't be. And actually policy is where we actually need the impact. You need policies that support farmers to change their lives in ways that are meaningful for them. Um, so for, for ACIA, we are increasingly interested in understanding how we can better influence policy to have sustainable impacts for farmers that meet the farmers needs. Um, if I look at if you look at Indonesia, there was a mega rice project in Indonesia where they drained peatlands of, of of, of water and they decided they were going to grow rice on it to feed all of Indonesia and it completely failed um, for obvious reasons from a soil science perspective. We now need policy that helps re-wet that peat, helps give the people who live on peat meaningful livelihoods and that's an incredibly challenging space so policy is really needed but also IT like software the digital tech of, of, of the world is is looking at agriculture as the, as the probably the biggest growth area in in, in digital technologies um, we've got to feed the world with less people and there's less farmers less and less farmers out there so you know I, I think you know, th there's so many opportunities in development and it needs the full spectrum of, of skills from from extension agents to scientists to engineers to everything. Yeah? So mm. don't, you don't think you have to be a PhD to be in agricultural research for development. Exactly right, James. And even um, that whole climate topic that you brought up as well, that's going to require a whole set of policy, environmental, everything's going to stem yep. from that as well. So um, Zoe and Lisa, do you guys want to comment on that one? Um, I guess same as James, like agriculture needs to be multidisciplinary because you need those different perspectives. You need a holistic solution. Like even for our farmers, one of the biggest struggle for them to get to market is their branding and like even how they present that produce if they're trying to sell to individual customers. Um, so that's like marketing, branding, design, things like that. So that's a whole different skill set compared to agricultural science. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you are looking to go into agricultural development, just start networking, see what connections you can establish um, because you never know what opportunities are going to come up from meeting new people mm -hmm. um, and take up opportunities as they come. Even if you're a bit unsure, just like go for it. Like we wouldn't be here if we hadn't taken up placements and just said yes to moving to a different country. So yeah, yeah just go with it and see where it takes you. Yeah. And I think the only other thing to add to that is, uh, as Cooper had mentioned, um, like people are always interested in what's going on in things and people can also be just as nervous about something as you are. And I think to me that reflects that everyone is human. Um, and this really kind of honed into us when we met with the top, I don't know if it was PM or something, but he was like top dog in the Ministry of Agriculture. And this is us two like young female mm. um, Australians, not even Fijian, um, <laughs> trying to meet with the top dog in Ministry of Ag. And then when we did, he was just chill. He's just a human, he's passionate about ag. And you know, you just he started was, the conversation. He just wanted to chat and like, see how we could work together to yeah. improve Fiji's agricultural system. So like, if you give people a chance, um, I think that's another big thing as well yeah so just taking that first step and seeing where you can go and also your degree is going to be amazing and yeah it's just going to be so neat in the future so that's <laughs> awesome <laughs> thanks guys um so we've probably got time for two more um i've got one here how do we change the system to be fit for purpose so how can we ensure that we listen to those who are getting the help to be kind to, the, to get the kind of help that they need rather than the donor country telling the recipient, recipient what they need. So I suppose this is the, the top down approach of where a researcher will come in and say, you guys need this, this and this to become um, more developed. How, how do we change that system and how do we bring the growers and the farmers along with our um, development research? That can be anyone who answers that one. <laughs> James, paper scissors are up. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm happy to. I'm happy to have a crack first, if, if that's okay. Look, the world has changed dramatically in the last thirty years. If you look at Asia in in the 1960s, pre 1960s, there were frequent famines. There was there was the, the whole of Asia was 
poverty stricken. There were, there were people dying of starvation and a freak on a regular basis. Once they secured their food resources, that's what built a foundation that allowed the tiger economies of Asia to grow. And if you go back to when Asia started, our biggest program of work was in China. And China was considered a bit of a basket case. We, 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 we helped introduce conservation agriculture practices into China, which is probably one of the biggest scaled um, technologies that ACU can can attribute its influence on anywhere in the world. But those countries are now, they're becoming donors themselves. Like we work in the Philippines. The Philippines co-invest with us in any research we do in the Philippines. Vietnam's heading down the same path. Indonesia's looking at similar approaches. They set the agenda. What we need to do is ensure that the agenda is set to meet the farmers' needs. Yeah. So what we need to do is really, from a research perspective, understand what the farmer's life is actually like. We can't go in there and say, you should become a, you're a rice farmer, you should become a vegetable farmer. We have to understand the culture, the, 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 the systems, everything, that farmer's livelihood, their decisions are made for reasons that are their reasons. And we have to absolutely respect that and understand it and then try to build solutions that work within that context. The top-down approach happily is, is, well, I guess may not be a thing of the past everywhere. I don't, but certainly where we're working, we're very much trying to look at the farmer first and the problem definition around the context in which that farmer lives and works. Cooper? Thanks, James. I just totally agree with what you said, James. Um, I think that, yeah, I think for most people in this room, you know, understand the principles and concepts of working in a participatory way. And, and I think a really important process, you know, when we get really excited and we go somewhere and we've got these ideas, it's we want to speak, but I think part of it is just having, just sitting down and listening mm. you know, mm. and actively listening and listening at all levels. And spending time in community so you understand, you know, like what James is saying, it's about understanding culture and people. How can we do that from afar? It's a pretty difficult thing to do. We really need to be spending time in those rural areas. But I think even for, for everyone, it's always going to be a challenge because people who are the poorest live, their voices are very hard to hear. Mm. They live in very isolated places. They don't have access to phones. They're a, way, a long way from the tarmac, that's for sure. So I think we need to be active in the way that we're identifying those groups that we're working with. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Cooper. And and yeah, doing interviews like the like the girls have done and getting on site, like both of everyone here on this call has been in, you know, in country for an extended period of time, just learning about the culture and then yeah, building a network so then you can reach those isolated um, communities and, and really understand their needs and, and their wants. So um, I think we've probably run out of time. Uh, but that's just kudos to the amazing responses and presentations of um, our panelists today. I just want to say a massive thank you on behalf of Raid and Crawford Fund for uh, Cooper, James, Zoe and Lisa for taking your time out of your very busy schedules um, and jumping on and having a chat about, you know, all things agriculture for development, your careers and encouraging, you know, a lot of us on the call today to just be confident and take the leap into international ag development. So thank you, you're all doing amazing work. And I was very inspired, which I'm sure many of the um, attendees were today. Uh, just closing comments, a big thanks to the team that's working behind me today. We've got uh, Kayla and Belinda and Kathy all in the background here, making sure that we all look fabulous on screen. Um, and one last thing, Belinda's probably popping some things in the chat right now, but if you want to reach out to Raid or Crawford, please follow some of our links. Um, and if you want to get in touch with any of our speakers, I'm sure that they would be more than happy to uh, chat all things Ag for Development. Uh, one more thing is that we are actually recruiting in our Raid events team. So if you're interested in helping create events like these, uh, please get in touch. We'll pop our email address in the chat um, and we're more than happy to have some more people on board because we want to continue to produce these events um, and make sure that we're reaching everyone that we possibly can. So thank you so much guys um, and I hope you all enjoyed today. Happy National Ag Day too. <laughs> Thanks for having us, this was fantastic. No have a guys. great day. Yeah, that Thanks was everyone. great. Thanks everyone. Thank you. See ya, bye.